Well, boys and girls, it's me, Rattenboro, back again. Today, we're going to talk about a group of animals that you already know a little something about, based on your own personal experience. Hilda Hippo is one of these, and I am one of these. Remember our mnemonic? All my best friends represent vertebrates? Yes, the letter M in the word my stands for mammals. And guess what? You are mammals too. Who can name some characteristics of mammals? In what ways are you like Hilda and me? What keen observations you make? Yep, we are warm-blooded vertebrates with hair. I think you could help me teach this lesson. Let's begin with the name of the group, mammals. It comes from the Latin word mammalia. The word mammalia refers to a group of animals who possess mammary glands. Mammary glands are milk-producing organs belonging to female mammals. When female mammals give birth, they secrete a nourishing substance, milk, to feed their young. That is one of the primary characteristics of mammals. We feed our young milk. That's right. Rats drink mother's milk, hippopotami drink mother's milk, and so do humans. The mother's milk has all the nourishment that a baby needs. Mammals have backbones. Reach around and check out your back once more to make sure your backbone is still there. Of course it is. Without backbones, we wouldn't be able to sit up straight or hold our heads in the air. And our spinal cords that house the nerves that send messages to our brains would be unprotected. So, because we all have backbones, scientists call us... What? Yes, that's quite right. We are all vertebrates. Reptiles, amphibians, and fish all have a relatively low metabolism and, as you've learned, are classified as cold-blooded animals. Like birds, mammals, such as this horse, have a high metabolism, burning lots of energy to help them maintain a constant internal body temperature. What's the term that taxonomists use to classify mammals in terms of body temperature? Yeah! We're all warm-blooded. One of you was right when you said that mammals are covered in hair or fur. Some of us are hairier than others. Hilda Hippo and other hippopotamuses don't look so hairy, do they? But you might remember that they do have a little bit of hair around their mouths and on the tips of their ears and tails. Let's take a look at a few of our furrier friends. Here's one of my favorite mammals. I love his stately long neck and envy his ability to reach high into trees to eat leaves and to see into the distance. I'll bet that if I were as tall as a giraffe, I could spot my enemies more quickly. Does anyone know what this other animal is? It's a yak. Yaks need their shaggy hair and dense woolly undercoats to help them stay warm on the cold Tibetan plateau where they live. Tigers and leopards have fur. Look at this Bengal tiger and this beautiful snow leopard of Central Asia. Both of these cat species are on the list of endangered species, a list of animals whose numbers have dwindled due to the loss of habitat and overhunting. Does anyone know what this is? It's a marmot, a type of squirrel. And here's another type of squirrel, a flying squirrel. These squirrels don't really fly, but they have two folds of skin on the sides of their bodies that let them take great leaps, gliding through the air with the help of their tails for steering. The only mammals that can truly fly are bats. They have skin between their long fingers that stretches out, turning their arms into wings when they open. Bats may seem like birds, however, they are not because they have no feathers. They actually have a fine fur and they give birth to live young. Most, but not all, mammals are terrestrial, meaning that they live on land. Can anyone think of an aquatic mammal? A mammal that lives in the water? I'll give you a hint. One of them is my friend, Hilda. Ah, yes, hippopotami love the water but they are actually semi-aquatic, meaning that they live partly in water and partly on land. 
Usually, Hilda and other hippopotami stand in the water during the day to cool, keep cool. Then they graze on land when evening falls. Whales are marine mammals, meaning that they live in the ocean. The blue whale is not only the largest mammal, but it is also the largest animal on Earth. Blue whales can grow up to 100 feet long. That is longer than a basketball court. Its tongue alone weighs more than three tons. Imagine that. Manatees and smaller whales, such as dolphins and porpoises, are also fully aquatic marine mammals. They share saltwater seas with walruses and seals, semi-aquatic animals that like to wander on shore just like Hilda Hippo does. Marine mammals are believed by scientists to have evolved from land mammals, and they share many of the same characteristics. They are warm-blooded, they have backbones and fur or hair, even though sometimes it's the tiniest amount of hair, and they breathe oxygen from the air. Remember when we talked about how fish use gills to breathe in oxygen from the water? Remember how in amphibians those gills develop into lungs requiring amphibians to come to the surface of the water to breathe air? Well, mammals also have lungs. All mammals have lungs and an underlying diaphragm that assists in breathing. When the diaphragm tightens, it creates more space in the lung cavity and air is drawn into the lungs. All mammals, including whales and por porpoises, dolphins and manatees, must come to the surface now and then to breathe. Some mammals also live in freshwater. I want to introduce you to another semi-aquatic relative of mine. It is a capybara. He, like me, is classified as a rodent and likes to swim. The duckbill platypus is unusual. It's one of only few mammals that lay eggs. Spiny anteaters, also native to Australia and nearby islands, are the only other egg-laying mammals. All other mammals are live-bearing, which means they give birth to live young. The young are nourished inside the mother's body, and most are fully developed when they're born, looking like smaller versions of their parents. A few, like kangaroos and possums, are part of a group of mammals called marsupials. Marsupial babies are very underdeveloped when they're born, but they move directly into their mother's protective pouch to be nourished by her milk. All mammals, whether hatched from eggs or born live, feed on the mother's milk in their infancy. Remember learning that birds' beaks may provide clues to their diets? The same is true of mammals' mouths. Wide mouths and sharp pointed teeth suggest that these mammals may be carnivores. Wolves, whales, and bats are all carnivores. Herbivores are more likely to have long jaws, long tongues, and flat teeth. Deer, sheep, and pandas are all herbivores. Omnivorous mammals include bears, possums, chipmunks, and mice. Many humans are omnivorous, but humans think about the choices they make about what they eat. Omnivores generally have sharper front teeth and flat teeth for chewing in the back of their mouths. Think about your mouth. Do you think humans were designed to eat meat, only plants, or both meat and plants? Why? Next time, we'll look at the last of my slides. Be ready for a review of the five vertebrate groups of the animal kingdom. Amphibians, mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles. I'm sure you are becoming quite skilled at classifying animals, and we'll get to have some fun with doing just that. Can't wait. See you soon.